Thank you for inviting me to Dallas. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, every time that I come to the symposium, I need to remind people that many years ago in the late 90s, uh, one of my classmates from residency training, Dr. Douglas Kerr, came with the crazy idea to establish the Transremyelitis Center at John Hopkins. <clears throat> uh, his idea was nobody around the world knows about transremyelitis, so it's time to start working on that. And in 1999, with Doug and Dave Arani, and later with Chitra and uh, Adam Kaplan and Ben Greenberg, we committed ourselves to this uh, uh, entity that was the Transremyelitis Center. And along with us, there was an amazing person who I admire very much and is here, is Sandy, who basically, with the support of the Transmyelitis Association, helped us to uh, establish the Transmyelitis Center. And in the past 10 years, has been a very, very rewarding uh, 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 effort because uh, we have been able to uh, have a better understanding and we have progressed a lot in uh, providing care and understanding much better the needs of patients with transmyelitis. So it's a great pleasure to be here with the Transmyelitis Association and all of you. And what I'd like to do is very simple. I'd like to talk about what is transmyelitis. A little bit of a press release. Uh, I do apologize because in your handouts you don't have anything about my talk, but if you have an email and you email me, I will be very happy to send a PDF with uh, all of these lectures and notes. And I will mention that the Transmyelitis Center is open every day. Uh, this is our phone number. Uh, if there are physicians around uh, the country who likes to establish contact with us for any advice, they should call us, and this is the phone number. Uh, this is our email, and if there is any emergency, uh, there is a 24-7 neurologist on call for transmyelitis that may get in, uh, 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 through us using the Hopkins access line, and that is the 1-800 number. Uh, I need to mention that uh, we have a full-time uh, person who is my boss, is Maureen. Maureen was... Uh, uh, here uh, uh, in Dallas, uh, working with Ben, and she moved back to Maryland, fortunately. And uh, she is in charge of the transmyelitis, neuromyelitis, optica, and clinical program. You have a question. All right. Okay. It's okay. So I was talking about, about Maureen because um, uh, many times, if you have phone calls to Hopkins, the TM Center, or the neuromyelitis, optica center, Maureen is going to be very attentive to all your questions. There you go. Okay. Almost there. Okay. Maureen is uh, a very well experienced registered nurse. She has a lot of training, not only in intensive care, but in transmyelitis. I need to advise you that uh, she is also a, a red skin uh, fan, so be <laughs> careful with that. All right. So let's talk about transmyelitis. For understanding transmyelitis, we need to be aware what are we dealing with. And we are dealing with the spinal cord. The spinal cord is part of the central nervous system, and the spinal cord is a very well-organized structure that maintains communication between our brain and the rest of our body. So what I plan to do in the next 25 minutes is to concentrate a little bit on the anatomy and I'd like to explain how transmyelitis may express uh, as a clinical problem, how we evaluate a patient with transmyelitis, how um, transmyelitis may affect the spinal cord, and how we treat transmyelitis. So let's start with the brain. The brain is the most important part of our, uh, of our body. It's the most important organ because the brain designs and organizes all our knowledge and facilitates all the interaction uh, with the environment and facilitate the function of the rest of our body. And the brain works with many other areas and many other receptors, the vision, the hearing, uh, the muscles, the taste, 
and the brain needs to be in contact with all of the structures of the body using cells. And the most important part of um, the most important part uh, o, uh, of the brain is a cell that is called a neuron. And the neuron has a central station that we call the neuronal cell body, in which all the information, chemical information, is stored. But the neuron has a very long process that is, in some cases, few millimeters of length, but in some cases is very long up to one meter or more particularly in those neurons or those neurons that communicate the brain with the spinal cord. And this fiber that is called axon is frequently surrounded by a plastic material that we call myelin, and that myelin facilitates the process of electrical transmission between the cell body and the end of that process that is going to communicate with the different organs of, 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 the, of the body. The myelin is produced by a uh, very specialized cell that is called oligodendrocyte, and the major purpose of that is to facilitate uh, electrochemical communication between this cell, that is the neuron, and the target. In this case, an example, the muscle, facilitate the function of that muscle. So the cell body is constantly here, the, the neuronal cell body is constantly producing chemicals that are being transported through the axon and end up in the terminal uh, uh, connection and stimulate muscles or the parts of, uh, of our uh, uh, central nervous system. Now, we already learned that the immune system has different uh, agents that may interfere with the function of that neuron. We already know that there are T cells, T cells that may target the function of the neuron, T cells that may target the function of the myelin, or may disrupt the function of the entire uh, network provided by, by the neurons. So the immune system basically, at some point, uh, instead of helping the, the, the function of the central nervous system, may produce damage. And this is one of the unfortunate situations that may happen in uh, some uh, disorders or neurological disorders, such as demyelinating disorders or neuroinflammatory disorders. The immune system turn again, this basic unit of the central nervous system that is the neuron. Now, what is the spinal cord? So the spinal cord is the main avenue, the main, main bridge in the communication between the brain and the rest of our body. And the spinal cord is in this very strong case that is the spinal column and is very well protected by this bony structure and this spinal cord is a very, very well-organized structure because facilitates the communication from the brain down to different organs and from the external areas of our body back to the brain. So in that way, the spinal cord is organized in different sectors. So we have the spinal cord, the gray matter in the spinal cord is inside of the spinal cord. And this gray matter contains a lot of the neuronal cell population that facilitate motor function or neuronal cell population that facilitate sensation. In other words, this is a very well organized network that is going to facilitate movement and is going to facilitate the perception of different uh, stimuli into the uh, uh, central nervous system. The spinal cord is also organized in different pathways that are facilitated by uh, the white matter. Again, in the spinal cord, the gray matter is inside of the spinal cord, the white matter is outside. And in this white matter, there are different avenues, there are different uh, pathways. There are pathways that are going down, meaning that these are descending pathways, or pathways that are going up, meaning that those are ascending pathways. Why is that organized in that way? Well, it's organized in that way to facilitate function. And all of these ascending tracks are carrying information from the sensory system. The ascending tracks are carrying the information from the motor system. And this is very important for our motility. For example, the brain, in def different areas of the brain, like the cerebral cortex, generate a lot of information for different areas of the body, arms, legs, and that need to be transmitted down to those muscles. So the brain organizes the information in the cerebral cortex and the axons from those uh, cortical areas are going down into the spinal cord 
and they are going to generate electrical impulses that end up in a stimulation of muscles. At the same time, these pathways that are going down into the spinal cord are very susceptible to damage. If there is anything affecting these pathways, meaning any infection in the spinal cord or in the brainstem of the brain, or any process like demyelination, that is going to be translated clinically in presence of weakness, paralysis, presence of any uh, uh, muscle cramps or spasticity that are frequently the major symptoms that are uh, 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 expressing this function of the motor system. On the other side, we have the sensory function. The sensory function is coming from outside of the central nervous system, meaning that there are several receptors in our body, like when you have perception of pain or perception of vibration, this information is carried uh, by peripheral nerves into the spinal cord and immediately is taken up to the brain where this information is being processed by the cerebral cortex and it will give you the ability to identify potential areas of danger. For example, if there is uh, excessive heat and the uh, thermic receptors here stimulate the spinal cord, our brain immediately is going to communicate with the uh, coordinator of, of that function and immediately is going to be a withdrawal and that means that it's going to be communication with the motor system. So this is a very well organized system and a highly organized uh, uh, network of uh, connections. Again, the sensory function may be disrupted in different areas, may be disrupted in the peripheral nerve, may be disrupted in the spinal cord, and that may have consequence from a clinical point of view, like a presence of pain, lack of sensation, abnormal sensation, sensation or lack of uh, balance. There is a misunderstanding with the term transverse myelitis. There is always the concept the transverse myelitis is just the cross section of the spinal cord. Well, that happened, and when that happened, unfortunately, almost all function of the spinal cord are shut down, meaning motor function, sensory function. Fortunately, the frequency of the complete transverse myelitis is relatively rare as compared with the more frequent uh, partial involvement of the spinal cord. For that reason, we need to understand a little bit of the topography of the lesions that are affecting the spinal cord because that is going to translate clinically in different symptoms. Sometimes, and you may have experienced this, there are more problems with motor function as compared with sensory function. Sometimes there are more problems with bladder function because the pathways that are organizing and controlling the bladder are probably the pathways that are affected as compared with other pathways of uh, sensory function or motor function. So it's extremely important to understand where the lesion is located in the spinal cord because that means for function or dysfunction. Let me give some examples. Do you remember that we have white matter? Yeah? We do, right. The white matter is outside of the spinal cord. This white matter is highly organized uh, we know uh, this is the posterior region of the uh, uh, spinal cord that we call posterior columns. When there is myelitis or damage of the spinal cord in this region of the spinal cord, that is going to translate clinically in lack of proprioception, meaning that your body is not going to know, your brain is not going to know very well what is the position of your legs. So these property is located here in this area that we call posterior columns. There are areas of the lateral columns that carries the motor information. So if there is any damage of this uh, lateral column, this is going to be translated clinically in lack of motor input, meaning there is going to be weakness or paralysis. So the spinal cord is going to be, uh, 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 is going to be affected in different ways. If you have a lesion that is affecting in the entire spinal cord, what is going to happen is there is not going to be motor or sensory function. It's going to be disrupted completely. But if the lesion is affecting only one part of the spinal cord, it depends what is the location of the lesion for the type of symptoms that the patient may experience. You uh, may know that uh, many patients with transverse myelitis have something that we call sensory level, meaning that there are areas of the spinal cord where the sensory input is disrupted. That 
is going to have consequence in this si clinical situation as patients are going to have a specific areas of the chest or abdomen that are going to be having a significant deficit in perception of pain or sensation. There are other areas of the brain, of the spinal cord that are uh, very well organized for motor function and that obviously may produce problems of weakness. And as I mentioned before, the areas of the posterior columns are very famous in the anatomy of the spinal cord because there are very characteristic disorders that may affect this specific area of the spinal cord. One of them is vitamin B12 deficiency. Every time that a patient comes to my clinic, automatically is tested for vitamin B12 because vitamin B12 deficiency frequently mimic a lot of neurological disorders, and this is one of the most important aspects in the evaluation when patients with transient myelitis come to our clinic. There are recent uh, reports, for example, that uh, there are some patients that have uh, chronic diarrhea in which they are losing a lot of copper that uh, uh, produce deficiencies in copper, and that deficiency is going to be uh, translated in damage of the posterior column. Uh, there are Historically, there, there has been a classic disease that affects the spinal cord is syphilis. Fortunately, we don't see syphilis as we saw before, but it's still one uh, area of concerns in some areas of the country. There are other disorders, like uh, disorders that produce metabolical dysfunction that can affect areas of the white matter or gray matter, or in patients with some types of transient myelitis, there is a complete disruption of those uh, pathways. This is perhaps one of the most common situations that we may encounter in transient myelitis, particularly when there is evidence of damage of the central portion of the spinal cord. Here, we may have a combination of problems. We may have a combination of problems because this type of lesions affects not only the gray matter, but may affect the white matter as well. So if that's the situation, we may have problems in which the patient may experience paralysis of hands or legs, or a patient may experience some sensory problems in specific areas of the body. And this is probably the most frequent situation that we encounter uh, with uh, transplant myelitis. Now, let me move from the anatomy to what's happening in a spinal cord in a patient with transplant myelitis. What is the problem? So, in transplant myelitis, we may have two types of pathological situations. Pathology is uh, the terminology that we use, pathology is the term that we assign to a science that evaluate the nature of the lesions in different tissues. So the pathological as assessment of patients with transient myelitis, for example, demonstrate that patients may have inflammation, inflammation that is what has been explained in previous lecture, the accumulation of inflammatory cells in areas of the spinal cord that produce damage of the tissue, produce infiltration by lymphocytes or other uh, cells of the immune system, and eventually, when the situation is very aggressive, may lead to damage, complete damage of the spinal cord. In this case, we call this necrosis, meaning that there is an irreversible change and damage of the tissue because the tissue is devoid of uh, oxygen, blood supply, and in those, part, in, in those uh, particular situations, we have a very aggressive damage of the spinal cord. Now. You may be familiar with this. This is the common numerator, but different denominator of many patients. Weakness in lower extremities, a belt-like band of tightness in the abdomen, numbness in the tingling, num numbness and tingling in lower extremities, and bladder dysfunction. This is the major core of symptoms that patients with spinal cord disorders may experience at some point during their illnesses. And the physician should ask then, what is the time course of those problems? Because that is going to be an extremely important information for establishing a differential diagnosis. Is this a problem that is started in a matter of minutes or in a matter of hours? Or is this something that has been going on for weeks and stay there for weeks and then improve? Or is this something that gets worse for some hours, some days, then get better, get worse, get better? So the nature of the time course of the symptoms is extremely important for facilitating a better identification of uh, the cause of the transient myelitis. For example, in the terminology of transient myelitis, we, we have problems that appear acutely, like myelopathies that are associated with 
damage of the blood supply and in those particular situations the presence of symptoms is very quick patients have very rapid progression of symptoms patients with ischemic damage of the spinal cord uh, are normal now and in matter of minutes and hours are paralyzed because this is a really an, a very aggressive damage of the spinal cord that may be uh, produced either by damage of the arterial system, the blood supply, damage of the venous system, or presence of some abnormalities that are called arteriovenous malformation that produce the damage of the spinal cord. Now, most commonly, we have what we call myelitis, that is the inflammatory myelopathy that is frequently associated with processes like infections, viral infections, or post-infection disorders that produce immunological reactions that eventually are going to affect the spinal cord, or demyelination, or presence of autoimmunity. So all of these factors eventually are going to produce inflammation that is going to produce dysfunction in the spinal cord. So the main goal of my lecture is to focus here. I will spend just a few seconds explaining that ischemic myelopathy is a disorder in which the blood supply of the spinal cord is uh, affected. The spinal cord is uh, supplied by blood vessels that are distributed along the spinal cord. And when there are factors like uh, damage of the arteries, trauma, that obviously is going to produce a significant damage of the spinal cord. And as I mentioned before, these are clinical situations that evolve quickly and in matter of hours patients may be paralyzed. Uh, many of these uh, vascular problems are associated with infarctions in arterial uh, territories, particularly uh, an artery that is very tiny, that is called anterior spinal artery. Sometimes these uh, vascular problems are associated with venous thrombosis in the same way that the artery may be occluded, some veins in the spinal cord may be occluded. That happens frequently in some rheumatological disorders. Uh, there are occasionally arteriovenous malformations that are malformation of the structure of the blood vessels and that occasionally manifests with damage of uh, the blood uh, supply in the spinal cord. And occasionally trauma may produce damage of the cartilage that is present in the discal structure of the spine that may migrate to areas of the blood vessels and produce infarctions uh, in the spinal cord. As I mentioned before, the time course of all of these symptoms is extremely important for clarifying what is the nature of the disease and what is the differential diagnosis. Let me give you an example. When a patient has an acute myelopathy or acute myelitis that evolves in matter of hours or days, frequently we, ha we are dealing with problems of acute transfer myelitis or ischemic myelopathies. But occasionally we have patients that get myelopathic symptoms, they get better, they get the, those symptoms back, and this keep a pattern of relapsing and remitting symptomatology. Those are the situations that happen frequently with patients with multiple sclerosis or neuromyelitis optica. That is a variant of um, uh, inflammatory myelopathy. There are some conditions like neurosarcoidosis, that is a pulmonary disease that occasionally affects the spinal cord, in which there is a progressive inflammatory process in the spinal cord that lead to a, a, a very chronic and steady uh, damage of the spinal cord. So identifying the time course of these problems is extremely important. Now, what to do when there are problems or symptoms of transmyelitis? It is very important and is a patient responsibility to talk and talk and explain to the doctor what has been the time course of the symptoms so the doctor may understand what is going on. And it's a doctor's responsibility to do a very good examination and make sure that there is no uh, any miss of any important clinical sign. And it's responsibility of the doctor to understand and talk and try to clarify the different symptoms that the patient is experiencing. We use different tools. We use x-rays. Yeah, in the past 100 years, we have been using x-rays. But now we are using more and more magnetic resonance imaging that allow us a very good imaging of the spinal cord with a very good resolution and eventually a good clarification of the structural damage of the spinal cord. We may use blood testing for identification of infections or immunological problems. 
And importantly, we use a lot of spinal taps or lumbar puncture that allow us the uh, 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 analysis of the cerebrospinal fluid. And that is extremely important to clarify if this disorder that is presenting as weakness or sensory problem is associated with an inflammatory condition or is just part of a vascular ischemic process. There are many pathologies, many disorders that may be associated with transrhemilitis. We have autoimmune disorders. We have post-infections encephalomyelitis. We have vascular process. We even have neoplastic process that ma may affect the spinal cord and may mimic process of transmyelitis. And again, we have frequently problems with uh, demyelination that mimic uh, myelopathies. The spinal cord is very well evaluated by MRI and it's extremely important to do a very good assessment of that uh, spinal cord. These are three different examples of how the spinal cord may be affected. This is a patient that ha is an elderly patient who had something that we call a spinal stenosis, and unfortunately this patient had a trauma that led to the compression of the spinal cord and subsequently paralysis because there was a significant damage of the spinal cord above the area of compression. This is another patient, and this is another patient with inflammatory conditions that produce similar symptomatology, but in this case, the cause of the problem was demyelination and inflammatory process that damage the brain, the spinal cord. This is the most, one of the most frequent problems in the spinal cord. This is myelitis, but this type of myelitis is mostly associated with demyelination and multiple sclerosis. You can see here the main core of inflammation, and this is uh, the area, uh, uh, white shadow here. This is the spinal cord, this is the white shadow. This white shadow is prominently outside of the spinal cord, meaning that the main area of the spinal cord that is affected is the white matter. So this is really a clue to say that this is likely a demyelinating process. This is another MRI, and you can see a very extensive lesion, but this time the lesion is in the central portion of the cord as compared with the previous one. This is a clue because it is very unlikely that this lesion is going to be produced by MS, and in this particular case, this is probably one of the findings that we have in the classical uh, acute transrhemilitis or myelo uh, myelopath inflammatory myelopathy. The other approach that we use is, is analysis of the spinal fluid. The spinal fluid is very helpful because the spinal fluid uh, uh, contain cells, contain proteins, and contain elements of the immune system. And if we see that these cells are increased, the proteins are increased, and the immunoglobulins are increased, that may suggest that this patient may have a problem with an inflammatory myelopathy. So the analysis of the spinal fluid is critical for understanding what is the nature of the myelopathic problem that patients are experiencing. There are frequently uh, uh, challenges for the differential diagnosis, and I, as I said before, the clinical assessment along with the MRIs and the spinal fluids are going to help us to clarify the nature of the problem. In this case, ischemic myelopathies, for example, the MRI is very helpful because the lesion may be present in the spinal cord, but that lesion is not necessarily enhancing with the gadolinium. Contrary, Patients with inflammatory myelopathies have a lot of inflammation, and that is seen very well with gadolinium enhancement. Patients with uh, inf uh, inflammatory myelopathies have abnormalities in the cerebrospinal fluid, and that is manifested by presence of white cells, is manifested by presence of increasing proteins, and even increasing immunoglobulin index. So all of these uh, uh, approaches are going to help us to clarify if this patient has an ischemic process going on, or this is part of an inflammatory uh, process. Ten years ago, when we got together in this meeting, almost everything was around multiple sclerosis. Every transrhemilitis case that was diagnosed before 2000, everybody got diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. What we know now is that many of these disorders that were classified as multiple sclerosis uh, before are different. We know now that many of those cases are neuromyelitis optica. We know that some of those cases are associated with rheumatological disorders. We know that many of those patients are not necessarily demyelinating, but they 
stick with the diagnosis of transamylitis that is an entity, nosological entity. Some of those, uh, of, of these patients that were classified before as multiple sclerosis are now identified as acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. So we are learning more and more about the natural history of this disease or these disorders that allow us to have a better uh, comprehension of the problem. We know now, for example, that MS frequently involves not only spinal cord but also brain structures, that neuromyelitis optica involves permanently cervical and optic nerves, cervical spinal cord and optic nerves, and we know that spinal uh, cord involvement is almost exclusive for problems of uh, transamylitis. So in 10 years, we have learned a lot about the natural history of these disorders. What is going to happen in 10 more years? It's very possible that many of these rheumatological disorders are going to continue uh, uh, being clarified. It's very possible that different variants of multiple sclerosis are going to be reclassified. It's very possible that in transamylitis we are going to have a much better understanding of the different entities that are uh, involved in transamylitis. How to treat? I have 30 seconds for, for this. <laughs> so how to treat transamylitis? It depends on the cause. If you don't know the cause, it's extremely difficult to know how to treat. If you have vitamin B12 deficiency producing a myelopathy, fantastic. That's the best treatment. A lot of vitamin B12 and the patient is going to be better in a matter of weeks. If you have an arteriovenous malformation, there are ways to treat that. There is interventional radiology techniques that are able to collapse, collapse the fistula and eventually the patient can get better. If there is an arterial thrombosis, we are in trouble. We don't have tools yet for treating patients with arterial thrombosis, number one, because those are patients that evolve in a matter of minutes or hours, and when they arrive to the emergency department, it's too late. We don't have too many resources to do so. But there is a very interesting situation. We are learning a lot about the strokes, and you know that we are treating patients with a stroke with thromb thrombolysis, or medications that dissolve the clot. Eventually in the future, if we are able to bring patients quickly to the emergency department and identify that there is an arterial thrombosis, we may treat those patients with thrombolysis. But it's still quite a way. Inflammatory myelopathies are treated predominantly with steroid treatment, you know that. And now we are using more and more plasma exchange to clean up immunoglobulins. We are treating with different immunosuppressant medications and we are partially effective in controlling the inflammation. So this area is becoming more and more a standard of care now for the treatment of myelopathy. Dr. Ben Greenberg is behind. Yeah, I saw him. <laughs> and the most important part is to say the physician need to understand what is going on first before commit a patient to treatment. It's going to be a mistake to put a patient with an ischemic myelopathy with damage of the spinal cord associated with an arterial thrombosis. It's really a dangerous to put a patient in cyclophosphamide for immunosuppression. So the physician needs to understand very well what is the process that he's dealing with or she's dealing with for giving advice to the patients about treatment. Now, Moving from medications, rehabilitation is the most critical part of transamylitis treatment. Rehabilitation, 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 rehabilitation. If you don't have rehabilitation, if there is no an effort to do rehabilitation, patients are not going to recover. Why? Because esteroid treatment is not going to solve that. Esteroid treatment is just to control the immune system. Immunosuppression is just to control the immune system, right? Immunosuppression is not going to recover function. The only way to recover function is rehabilitation, rehabilitation, rehabilitation. There is going to be a focus on stem cells. That is our dream. How far away we are from that dream? I don't know. I have an element of skepticism, but we need to be always positive and have that dream there in our mind. So eventually that's coming very soon. What is the best treatment for the transamylitis in 2010? A cup of cappuccino for the person who answered that. <laughs> what is the best treatment? 
Okay, there is another better. <laughs> vitamin P. Do you know what vitamin P is? What, what, is, what is the effect of vitamin P? Be positive, be proactive, and that's the best that you can do. <laughs>